Okay, Professor Duflo, um, can I call your book a pragmatic book to find pragmatic solutions for poverty problems? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I think yes. That would be a good Yet the subtitle in English is called a radical rethinking. Does that mean that in general too few people think pragmatic? In that field, I think that's a bit uh, the problem. In a lot of people, uh, and historically, have been working with definitions of the poor that are very, very uh, simple, more like caricatures, and have been thinking about solutions to poverty based on these caricatures. And that's not very pragmatic because no one is like one-dimensional caricatural, the poor less than anybody else. Mm -hmm. Uh, in our country, as in many other countries, I think you have a, a constituency, a kind of social movement which is concerned with the South, uh, developing countries, poor people in, de in, in developing countries. If you would, yeah, if you would say, say them, well, we have to do this or that to improve the situation, what, what would you tell them? Well, you can't tell them, like, one thing or even two things like the whole premise of our book is that there are no magic bullet there's not one thing that is going to take care of the problem once and for all uh, the corollary of being pragmatic is to say well there's not one problem there's thousands of problems and each of those is as a solution mm. or maybe we don't yet know what the solution is but we can look for it so in a sense, you would have to ask the question a little bit more specifically. I'll try. Uh, can people do something useful here, people that live in, in Western Europe? Yes, definitely. Uh, if you, on the website of our book, we, we list uh, a number of NGOs who are doing work that we think is good work. In that, that's good programs that have been demonstrated to be effective. Uh, for example, a remedial education program or an immunization program, a program for drinking water, sanitation, and they do it well, which is two things that you need. So people can start by giving a bit of money to that. That's easy. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes also social movements here say it's not only about help, it's also by... Uh, another kind of organizing trade for instance and and or yeah doing advocacy work in the, in this field do you think that advocacy can have a positive influence too it depends a bit what it is for i mean it, in a sense advocacy is also what i am doing uh, the issue is when it becomes advocacy for its own sake then that's not sufficient. Like mm. you need to know what you're advocating for. Mm. Uh, and well, f for instance, many people are talking already for decades about 0.7 percent of our GDP should be given to development cooperation. Do you think that's a useful, uh, uh, yeah, aim or objective? I think it's it certainly would be useful. Uh, that would uh, at least it would be useful if that money was spent well which right now it probably isn't in a large, large fraction, but it could be. Um, in a large... But in a it's large not going to... We should not fool ourselves. That that's not going to be solving the problem. Uh, the aid is a very small part of the story. From In the West, we tend to be completely focused on it because we are here, and so we think that matters, but 0.7% of our GDP is just not enough to 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 really make a difference. And if you look at the amount of money that's being spent on the poor people in the world, mostly it's being spent by the governments of those countries with their own resources. Mm -hmm. So aid is in some sense neither the problem nor the solution. It's a very small part of the problem or the solution. So you say the development policy of the countries themselves in the South is much more important. Absolutely. Yeah. And in a sense, what we need to work on uh, with in these countries and to some extent here that's possible as well is how to make those policies more effective. And it doesn't really matter who pays for it, if it's aid or if it's their own resources. What matters is the policies. In the last chapter, you, you 
you you talk about that uh, is it possible to influence governments from the outside to change their way of doing policy and well i think you say it's difficult to change them from the outside i think it's very difficult to do any wholesale change it's not that it never happens we've seen it happening in the arab world uh, during the arab spring but it's very hard to imagine when it's going to happen you cannot influence it you cannot predict so it's kind of move it moves on its own pace mm. however what we realize has a lot of importance is much more detailed features about the mm -hmm. way politics is organized mm -hmm. has very big impacts on decisions that are being taken and the legitimacy of those decisions and things like that. So I don't know if you would call it influence, but this is one way of saying that's a place where advice and design and all that is going to matter a lot. And it's not in at this like big mm. revolutionary level. It's at a much more mundane day-to-day -day level. Uh, but sometimes I think it's even more important. Our government sometimes, is the Belgian government, is, is thinking about Congo uh, um, and has many questions on the policy which is uh, well conducted there, but doesn't know exactly how, how to influence. But is it useful to try uh, to influence the politicians and to, to try to say, well, one of the things they have done now is if we see a better policy, we'll give you more money. Um, do you think that's a use good idea? Well, Congo is a difficult situation because it's particularly messy. Um, so that's an example of countries which has a lot of problems. So the question you have to ask yourself with a country like Congo is, given how bad it is, do we just wait until it becomes better or do we try to do something anyway? And a country like the US has sort of chosen the first path and mostly decided that they won't give money until governance improves. And I think that's a little, I, I can understand why would one would want to do that but that's a little taking the populations hostage there. Yeah, they are, they, they didn't are, pick the government. They are punished twice. They you didn't could say. choose. Yeah. So the question for a country like Congo is that: Is there any scope, any space, to do something uh, in a way that's going to be to help? So that might be, and the answer I think is usually yes, but it might take a lot of work to find the opening. It's not like the first place you're going to say, okay, fine, we are at least going to immunize every child. That might not be possible because it might be that the health sector is just the worst and the most corrupt. Mm -hmm. But it might be that somewhere else there is some opening. And it takes a little bit of opportunism in a way. But I think we've seen reasonably good policies happen in very bad environments. And I think it's important to maintain them because first they can help people here and now. You would do pretty simple programs, not anything like grandiose, like, you know, mm -hmm. vitamin A or iron, or things that are simple and definitely helpful. And the hope is that if the government starts delivering just a little bit, that increases the expectation that people have for it, and that plays its own small part into an improvement in the political process. Mm. Okay, last question. Um, could I say that your book, well, is an unideological book? And, and do you say that ideology is something useless? It's in a sense, it's a, it doesn't anti-ideology ideology, so you would call it an ideology as well. I don't know if ideologies are useful or are useless, they are what they are, but 
the problem is when they drive your actions entirely. And in the development world, an ideology usually means something like a cartoon character view of what the poor are and what their problems are. So they are slothful, or they are hungry, or they are enterprising, or whatever. And then from that one image, you derive a policy, and then you implement that policy in ignorance of the reality of the field. And then that policy persists out of sheer inertia. That's what we call 3 I ideology, ignorance, inertia. And that triplet is really deadly. That it's triplet, I think, is the reason why most things fail, not because of some inherent difficulty with them. But sometimes sim simplification is needed to, to have enough support of, of, of people. Yeah, but if it's at the cost of... If it's at the cost of actually having any grip on what's going on in the field, then that's not worth it. I think people are not stupid. And the hope, anyway, in writing that book is that if you treat them intelligently, if you explain the whole story to them without the shortcut, they will actually have the patience to read it. Okay, thank you. Thank you.